Did you know that on January 1, 1808, the abolition bill was passed in Jamaica? This meant that trading in African slaves was declared to be utterly abolished, prohibited, and declared to be unlawful. Full freedom was later granted to slaves in 1838. Many lost their lives fighting for this freedom we enjoy, and some take for granted today. Freedom from slavery, freedom to vote, and freedom to own property. The battle was fierce, but they stood their ground. In the end, mission accomplished. Thanks to our heroes, named and unsung, who championed the cause. On today's show, we look at the contribution of Sam Sharp and George William Gordon, plus our pre-independence political history and growth of technology. This is Jamaica Magazine, and the next 30 minutes promises to be very interesting and informative. I'm Adrian Atkinson. Stay with us. <laughs> Nutritious food, succulent dishes, superior workmanship, and excellent service. Jamaica is on the go. Let's grow what we eat and eat what we grow. Let's harness the indomitable spirit of our most valued resource, our people. Let's support our local businesses. After all, buying Jamaica means building Jamaica. Original. Good day, I'm Theodore Henry, and this is your GIS News for Thursday, August 2. Prime Minister Andrew Holness is urging Jamaicans to stand united to rid the nation of violence in all forms. These include harsh discipline of children, domestic violence, community conflicts, and expressions of violence in our music. Mr. Holness was addressing the nation in his emancipation message yesterday. He stressed that the violent system used to oppress our forefathers must not be patterned as a way of life in how we treat each other. Instead, the Prime Minister said the freedom won must evolve to a deeper respect for human rights and rejection of violence producers. Today, let us commit to emancipate our communities from the criminal gangs and dons that take away the freedom of our people and have them cowering under their beds in fear. Free yourself of the notion that the violent criminal gangs cannot be brought to an end. Resist them by using the trustworthy channels to provide information to the authorities. Leader of the opposition, Dr. Peter Phillips, also used his emancipation message to make a call for collective responsibility and action to maintain the gains of equal rights and justice. We will need the same level of cooperation to sustain our effort to build upon the foundations of our emancipation and provide every Jamaican with opportunity, food, shelter, security, health care, education, and all the benefits of modern life. Enhanced security has been provided for all workers involved in extinguishing the residual smoke at the Riverton disposal site. Local government minister Desmond McKenzie says this has become necessary in the wake of threats issued against the workers. In a statement yesterday, he said the workers had been threatened by unscrupulous persons who have a tradition of setting fires at Riverton with the intent of profiting from extinguishing the blaze. We are going to be providing funding, one, for all landfills across the country to have adequate security starting immediately. We are taking this matter very, very seriously. Another step that we'll be taking is that all landfill across the country will now have to stockpile adequate covering material as one of the response to the problem. 
The minister says there have been about 10 landfill fires over the past two months, including at retirement in St. James and Church Corner in St. Thomas. He revealed in a press briefing on Monday that these fires have cost the country more than $100 million. Meanwhile, the National Solid Waste Management Authority, NSWMA, has started negotiations with a government entity to secure lands for the relocation of persons living on the retirement landfill in St. James. There are reported 22 families living on the landfill. Local government minister Desmond McKenzie says all the fires at that landfill have occurred at the site where those families are living, highlighting the need for their removal. And while we do not want to legitimize the illegal activities, we cannot ignore the fact that if these people are to be relocated, then we should play a part in helping in the relocation. He says cabinet has been updated on the relocation plans, adding that he will make a formal request to the executive body at a later stage. The NSWMA has had to spend more than $12 million to extinguish the two recent fires at the retirement landfill. Director of Public Prosecutions Paula Llewellyn is urging the heads of financial entities to implement systems that can protect their operations against the increase in white-collar crimes. The DPP was speaking at the Jamaica Bankers Association Anti-Fraud Seminar recently. She pointed to police statistics showing that 1,758 cases of financial fraud were reported between 2009 and 2015 involving over 5 million U.S. dollars. White collar crimes like fraud, bribery, lottery scams, cyber crimes, identity theft, money laundering and forgery are becoming more attractive to criminals since they are often seen as less risky and more rewarding. Hundreds of Jamaicans will benefit from cataract surgery later this year thanks to the Chinese Bright Journey medical mission. That was shared during a recent courtesy call between members of the mission and Health Minister Dr. Christopher Tufton. Dr. Tufton said the support was much appreciated as this particular area of eye care is an underserved area in Jamaica. Bright Journey's visit to the island later this year will be their second. In May 2015, more than 200 Jamaicans benefited from free cataract surgeries at the Kingston Public Hospital, which also received medical equipment and supplies amounting to 400,000 US dollars. And finally, Akira Gawi is the winner of the 2018 Miss Jamaica Festival Queen competition. The new queen, who hails from St. Mary, was crowned during last night's finals at the National Arena in Kingston. Following the crowning, Culture Minister Olivia Grange commended the organizers for hosting a wide-reaching event. Tonight we had a sixth former, you know, and a number of these ladies have matriculated to tertiary level. Some are actual professionals, like teachers, and so it's, it, it's a broad spectrum of Jamaican women from all walks of life. It has definitely taught me resilience and strength. And I'm talking about the true meaning of resilience and strength. When you fall, you have to learn to get back up, brush yourself off and try again. Among Miss Gowie's winning prizes are $455,000 in cash, a trophy and $250,000 towards her national project. She also walked away with the most poised and culturally aware sectional cash prizes of $55,000 each. Miss Hanover, Shante Grant, and Miss St. James, Chrisanne Douglas, were the second and third place contestants. And that's it for JIS News Today. I'm Theodore Henry. Thanks for watching. Did you know that the Jamaica National Heritage Trust building on Duke Street was once the meeting place of our parliament? And not only that, it also served as the military headquarters of the War Office in 1814.
and was referred to as Headquarters House. It holds a lot of information on our pre- and post-independence periods. Here's more. The Jamaica National Heritage Trust is more than just a building that houses artifacts. It's a symbol of our post- and pre-independence period. Also known as Headquarters House, the JNHT is just one of many buildings that tell the story of our rich history. It got the name because it was once the military headquarters of the War Office in 1814. The building was constructed in 1755 and was home of Thomas Hibbert. On November 12 that same year, the Legislative Assembly met there while Hibbert was acting as Speaker. It later became the seat of government and the office of the Colonial Secretariat from 1872 to 1960. The government of the day in 1872 decided to move the capital from Spanish Town into Kingston this became the center of governance. This is where the Legislative Council used to sit. And after 1944, this is where the beginning of governance by the Jamaican people, elected through universal adult suffrage, became the seat of governance. After 1944, we had a number of other constitutions which led us to self-government and ultimately to independence in 1962. So it was in this room that Bustamante and Manley and other great luminaries of the legislative period of governance from 1944 used to persuade their party members to vote in their favor. And as a result of a combined effort, we agreed to become independent and we negotiated with Britain for the purposes of independence on June the 6th, 1962. The size of the chamber would suggest that the number of government officials were few. As a result of independence in 1962, the government also decided that they needed a new building to hold a larger parliament. And that's why Gordon House was created next door. So that's the joining relationship between this legislative council building, which is now the headquarters of the Jamaica National Heritage Trust, and Gordon House next door in which our parliament sits. It's a very exciting corner of Jamaica, a very exciting corner of Kingston. And of course, the political parties today, when they march to Gordon House, one party moves from headquarters house, as it is still known as, and the other party moves from the northern side of Duke Street and comes together in the parliament. The cabinet room, or the room in which the government uh, ministers sat is upstairs is in fact the boardroom of the trustees of the Jamaica National Heritage Trust today the building is used for a variety of different purposes which include the storage of artifacts as well as the various departments of the Jamaica National Heritage Trust so it continues to be a very important building of history and heritage for our people the fact that it was built in 1755 means that over these last 250 plus years, it has been subject to all sorts of natural disasters, including a fire next door, which nearly took it down. So hurricanes, earthquakes, floods, and other natural disasters, this building has been able to survive them all. Did you know that it was from this building on October 12, 1865, that Governor Edward John Eyre planned his attack against the St. Thomas Freedom Fighters? He declared martial law from this house on Friday, October 13. And it was also here that the right excellent George William Gordon was arrested in 1865 and taken to Marat Bay, where he was executed.
Before the untimely death of George William Gordon, he rallied the masses to stand up against injustice. This became part of the slave rebellion movement, which was met with great resistance. Nevertheless, they pushed forward. hundreds, the wealthy Scottish planter Joseph Gordon owned a large sugar estate in the parish of St. Andrew and lived in a beautiful Georgian great house on its grounds. In 1820, Joseph Gordon fathered a son with a slave woman. He was named George William Gordon. George William was not born a slave, although he was born before emancipation. He spent most of his childhood in the house set up by his father for his children born of this slave woman. From an early age, George Williams' father noticed his keen interest in books and encouraged him to study. The young Gordon was also a great orator and took part in religious debates at an early age. Gordon's commitment to religion never waned. He started an independent Baptist organization and erected a tabernacle in Kingston where he often preached. Gordon helped his followers to open chapels in many parts of the island and also ordained several deacons, including Paul Bogle of Stony Gut. In later years, this educated gentleman became a successful businessman. He concentrated on buying and leasing lands, which he cut up and sold or sublet cheaply to the Negro peasants, who at the time had great difficulty obtaining land. He also sold them livestock and organized a marketing system through which they could sell their produce at fair prices. Emancipation was not a welcome change for most of the planter class in Jamaica, and many tried by various means to hinder the progress of blacks. Gordon was a member of the wealthy middle class who did his best to help the free slaves. When he entered politics, he used this medium to speak out frequently about the unjust treatment of this group. By 1865, the social and economic crisis in Jamaica had reached a dangerous level. The harshness and insensitivity of the then governor, Edward Eyre, did nothing to relieve the tension. Gordon was outraged by the conditions he saw. Although he wanted to see a change in the social and material conditions of the blacks, he never advocated violence as a means of achieving this change. As a member of the Jamaican Assembly, he spoke out on behalf of the poor Negroes and bitterly criticized Governor Eyre. It was therefore ironic that he was blamed for instigating and supporting the Morant Bay Rebellion in St. Thomas. Despite the lack of evidence, Governor Eyre issued a warrant for his arrest. On hearing this, George William Gordon gave himself up to the authorities and was quickly taken to Morant Bay where he was illegally tried and sentenced to death. Gordon was hanged with 18 other persons on October 23, 1865. The residential area, now known as Cherry Gardens, is the former estate where George William Gordon was born. Did you know that the first general elections on the universal adult suffrage was in December of 1944? All males and females, 21 years and older, had the right to vote. Up next, the life and work of another unshakable stalwart who championed the cause of human rights. He's Sam Sharp, or Daddy Sharp. Samuel Sharp was the main instigator of the 1831 slave rebellion that began on the Kensington estate in St. James, which was largely instrumental in bringing about the abolition of slavery. 
Because of his intelligence and leadership qualities, Sam Sharp became a daddy or a leader of the native Baptists in Montego Bay. He used religious meetings as a way of organizing activities for the slaves, and there he was able to communicate his concern and encourage political thought concerning events in England which affected the slaves and Jamaica. Daddy Sharp believed in passive resistance, and in 1831, he encouraged many slaves to refuse to work on Christmas Day, demanding better treatment, and that slave owners consider their freedom. News of the plan spread to his supporters throughout St. James, Trelawney, Westmoreland, and even St. Elizabeth and Manchester. It reached the ears of some of the planters who got England to send warships that docked in Montego Bay and Manchester. On December 27, 1831, the Kensington Estate Great House was set on fire, a signal that the slave rebellion had begun. A terrible retribution followed, and while 14 whites died during the rebellion, more than 500 slaves lost their lives. Samuel Sharp was hanged on May 23, 1832, two years before the abolition bill was passed by the British Parliament, and six years before slaves in Jamaica gained full freedom. I'm deeply concerned by the number of Jamaicans killed on our roads. Safety on our roads is our responsibility. Jamaicans, drivers, passengers, motorcyclists, and pedestrians, slow down. Observe the rules of the road. Be courteous. Drive defensively. Be considerate. Buckle up. Wear a helmet. The careless overtaker is only rushing to the undertaker. Not observing the rules of the road could cost you your life and that of your loved ones. I encourage all road users to take special care as we use public thoroughfares. The life you save may be your own. Remember, your family wants you to arrive alive. We continue our journey back in time on a different note. This time, the evolution of technology in Jamaica. From live animal power to mechanized speed under the hood, narrow walkways and dirt tracks to multi-lane pavements and overhead carriageways. The technology of transportation in Jamaica has come a long way. Planes, trains and automobiles on the Jamaican landscape have evolved over the decades and centuries. Go back in time, say the late 18th, entire 19th, and even the early 20th century, and you're likely to find these. A mode of transportation that involved harnessing the power of animals, the not-so-simple carriages of yesteryear are the precursors to the pavement-eating machines that now use motors designed to convert energy into useful mechanical motion. By the latter part of the 1800s, trams, horseless, metal, steam-powered carriages running on tracks were a feature of Jamaican roadways. They were preceded by the railroad, Jamaica being one of the first in the Americas. And by the mid-1900s, had entirely moved aside to make room for the cars and buses that run independently on the paved streets that have been laid over former gravel and dirt tracks. After making landfall, the airways and sea lanes weren't far behind for motor technology. It's believed that the Jamaican sky saw its first plane in December 1911, when an American aviator, Jesse Seligman, took flight at the Knutsford Park Racecourse in what is now New Kingston. The national carrier Air Jamaica, now Caribbean Airlines, had its first departure flight to Miami on May 1, 1966. Commercial and domestic aviation is now a fully established mode of transportation for people and goods in Jamaica. Mm. 
The 1800s brought steamships and steam vessels quickly made their way to Jamaican waterways, eventually making room for the motorized speedboats, heavy cargo ships and cruise liners that we now find berthed at Jamaican docks. And after a long run, broken by about two decades of inactivity, passenger train service in Jamaica resumed in early 2011, at least on a trial basis. The system of communication has had its own technological revolution, and Jamaica has steadily remained in the know. Did you know that Jamaica received telephone service just two years after the invention of the device? In 1939, all major towns were connected through the all-island trunk telephone service. And April 1 was the day registered in history when the first connection was opened to the public, allowing persons to bypass the operator and dial direct. A few years earlier, 1936, brought the inauguration of a radio telephone service, allowing some people to speak directly with others in North America, England, Mexico, and Cuba. Then, the late 1900s and early 21st century witnessed an explosion of information technology in Jamaica. And going back, the earlier telephone technology had actually spawned its own offshoot in the telegram a device somewhere between the paper mail and the type most common today. Radio and television media in Jamaica have also come a far way. Telefunk and radio had been around for quite some time, allowing Jamaicans to pick up foreign radio stations. But it was not until July 9 of 1950 that commercial broadcasting actually started in Jamaica. That 1950s development brought us the Jamaica Broadcasting Company, later known as Radio Jamaica Limited, RJR. A cable radio service preceded it. Now, this came with a receiver box that would allow you to pick up the signal and then you could listen. The occasion on which I address you is somewhat historic because this is the first time that the head of the government of the island has been able to address the people of Jamaica through the medium of a Jamaican broadcasting station. The birth of Jamaica's first television station, the Jamaica Broadcasting Corporation, JBC 1963, was certainly a big deal. Through the decades, the spectrum has blossomed and satellites, cable and TV phones have made Jamaica a fully audiovisual nation. Did you know that the issuing of the first Jamaican postage stamp was in 1858 and the first use of nickel coin in Jamaica was in 1869? Jamaica Eye will play a part in increasing your public safety. Jamaica Eye is part of an island-wide network of camera surveillance systems designed to increase the safety of you, our citizens. If you have a camera system outside your home or office facing a public space, log on to jamaicaeye.gov.jm today. Jamaica Eye, we're all connected. The Ministry of National Security, creating a safer and prosperous Jamaica. As we close today's show, we ask that you stay connected via our website, jis.gov.jm. And while you're online, send your feedback to Jamaica Magazine at jis.gov.jm or via tweet at JIS News. On behalf of the entire production crew, I'm Adrian Atkinson. Thanks for watching. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.